Uh, let me introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Denis Magda. I am a software engineer at Oracle, working with different uh, small embedded stuff uh, right now. And this is, uh, uh, this is Derek White. He is from Sun Labs and Engineering Services. Uh, he is a great expert in different IT spheres, including uh, embedded area. So, and uh, as you can guess, uh, today we are going to check uh, whether a small embodied Java platform is suitable for robots development or not. So, first of all, before we start plunging into this theme, uh, read this information carefully. And this is an agenda. Some of you can already be aware of uh, small embedded Java. Uh, almost a week ago, uh, there was an official release, the first version of small embedded Java under the name uh, Oracle Java ME Embedded 3.2. But today we are not going to talk about uh, this release, its features, or, or its future goals. And today, uh, all this information you can learn from uh, sessions uh, spe specifically specifically devoted for it. For example, tomorrow you can visit uh, a particular session uh, and we can when we will give you a link to it at the end of our talk. <coughs> what we are going to talk about today uh, is that uh, while something is going wrong. Okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, while the first release of small embedded Java uh, was on its way of uh, productization. Uh, our team inside of Oracle decided to perform one research. Uh, the goal of research was to determine whether it is possible to run uh, Java on a very, very, on a very and truly constrained hardware. So we chose a particular microcontroller, uh, assembled a very simple robot, and uh, developed an, an optimized uh, Java version. Uh, and this Java version is totally based, is fully based on small embedded Java components. Some of these components um, are already part of the release of, of the release uh, 3.2, and some of the components uh, will be available in, an, in upcoming releases. And uh, after we talk about, after we have finished uh, with the talk of our research, uh, we will talk a little bit about Sunspot project. We can't uh, pass by uh, this uh, project because it's our pioneer inside of Oracle in a small embedded uh, area. And uh, this project has a lot of uh, results, great results and experience. And these results and experience are greatly re leveraged by small embedded Java right now. And um, of course, at the end, uh, we, will, we will provide you with some conclusions and we'll be glad to answer on your questions. So uh, let's look at, uh, as I said, we choose uh, a microcontroller for our investigation. Uh, first of all, we looked at touch devices characteristics for small embedded Java. Uh, it can be any microcontroller, a system or chip, or other internet of scene with, uh, for example, with such RAM, ROM, and CPU. If you see, there is a high-level border for RAM or ROM. Uh, in case of devices that, has, that have uh, uh, memory that exceeds 32 megabytes, Oracle offers another one product called Java IC Embedded. So it's not our area, and today we, and we work only with the devices that has less memory. What is interesting about a uh, lower border for RAM, ROM, or CPU frequency, then I, then I only can say that it's flawed. The numbers you can see right now uh, were only proved during our research, and maybe uh, in several weeks or on a month, they can be reduced. So it's only current result. Okay. Uh, this is a microcontroller that we uh, chose. Some of, some of you maybe are already familiar with it. It's very popular right now, embed dev board with NXP LPC 1768 MCU on it. Uh, as you see, it has Cortex M3 microprocessor uh, with uh, 68 kilobyte of RAM. Uh, but we, during our research, uh, we were leveraging only uh, 32 kilobytes of RAM. The other part of the memory were unused. What else to say? Uh, 
um, uh, now a lot of uh, dev boards, a lot of MCUs uh, provide you with support for such basic peripherals like GPIO, ADC, PWM, and so on and so forth. But it's great that more and more vendors more uh, start uh, producing microcontrollers with more advanced peripherals uh, like Ethernet or Wi-Fi or CAN and uh, USB and so on and so forth. And this particular, for this particular microcontroller, you see that it has uh, Ethernet, USB and CAN support uh, directly on a chip. What else, uh, what, what else I want to mention for you is the price for this microcontroller. Not, not for the microcontroller, for the dev board. Uh, the embed the dev board uh, costs about 60 bucks, uh, including tax, taxes. Tax. Uh, but if you, it, but it's, uh, its intention is only for development, for tests, and something like this, no more. But if you're going to make a product based on, uh, for example, Cortex MC M3 microprocessor, you can uh, uh, purchase a separate cheap, a separate MCU, and uh, here the cost starts from one box and to ten bucks, uh, so the price is much uh, is much lower than if you buy an, an embed and an, an, a dev board. Okay, uh, then we after after the microcontroller we bought different equipment. It's track chases, uh, motors with motors, two motors, battery model, and. Uh, different uh, infrared sensors, and remote uh, receiver, and controller. And uh, what is the most interesting part is uh, software. Uh, small embedded Java's uh, virtual machine is optimized CLDC, each IVM. Uh, it has a lot of features and characteristics that let it uh, to compete it on a small embedded area. Uh, in, on this slide, you can see only several of them. Uh, really, the list is greater. Uh, here, we present only those characteristics that were used by us for, uh, during the investigation. For example, for the, the first characteristics, we turned on a new garbage collector for small heaps, and it shows uh, better performance uh, for heaps the, uh, with size uh, less than. 256 kilobytes. Also, it's great that uh, our virtual machine has direct support for SAMP and SAM2 instruction sets. Uh, alternative byte code representation allows us to reduce uh, memory consumptions uh, in ROM or RAM area. <laughs> and the most aggressive optimization uh, that we turned on is closed world model optimization. Uh, the main idea of this optimization uh, is to eliminate all unused code from your final Java library, and not only the code of your application, but also the code of, for example, VM or different libraries that built on top of the VM. Uh, uh, additionally, what to add here, uh, CLDC HI virtual machine is now on its way of modularization. Uh, this ability uh, allows us to assemble a particular optimization you need for your product, for your, for your particular case. Uh, as an example for this robot, for our research, uh, we turned on optional dyna dynamic compiler, class load and verifier, and it led us to preserve uh, about uh, 50 kilobytes of, uh, of ROM, of static, of static memory. But uh, anyway, it's, it's great that we, we have, for example, a virtual machine that let us, lets us to run a bytecode on top of it. Uh, but as you know, uh, Java is famous for uh, its libraries that, that built on top of a virtual machine. And if we, to, if we start talking about uh, embedded development area, uh, that it is absolutely extremely necessary to have an API that, let you, that lets you get access to different peripherals located uh, on your hardware, on your MCU. For, for example, so like GPIO, PWM, and something like this. And it's, uh, it's great that uh, small embedded Java uh, has such API. It's called Device Access API. And as you can guess, uh, its goal is to get to provide you with access to all the peripherals located on the device and 
Additionally, you can, uh, you, you can use different permissions mechanism to control different, uh, to, to control access, access to different peripherals and resources. And uh, uh, from the beginning, we start thinking about power control and uh, as it's very important part uh, in embedded area. And as you see, in case of power control, if you, for example, switch off different peripherals, it can mm, let you to preserve uh, uh, a bit more energy for later usage. Uh, among some well-known and supported peripherals uh, that are included in device access API are the following you can see on your screen. The list is also is not complete and there are only some basic and well-known, for example, like generic output pins, different serial buses and PWM. Uh, and now let's talk about the demo. Um, here we have this robot. As you see on the picture, uh, you can see in the picture the embed dev board. It's located right here on top of the roof and we connected different, all the equipment together. Uh, here we have five infrared sensors uh, that let robot uh, operate in automatic mode. And also we have a simple infrared transmitter that let you control robot like a TV set, so no more. Uh, the robot is straightforward. The application is very simple, so don't wait uh, something intelligent action from this robot uh, as the main idea of uh, the investigation was uh, to put Java uh, on this constraint uh, hardware and to show that we can run not only a hello world demo but something like a real world application. So let's show how it moves. Uh, turn it on. Make him move forward. Nothing special. And then for example let him to move by himself, itself. Okay. You don't have a backup to a Yeah. <laughs> so, something like this. Uh, uh, what, uh, the, here you can see a code sample from the robot applications. Uh, we use device access API to get access to uh, one PWM output pin and several uh, GPIO pins. And uh, below um, in the code, we use them to control robot's engines and to, to make the robot move forward or backward. And as a result, uh, after we have finished with the port of Java on this hardware and creating this demo, uh, we calculated memory consumptions. Uh, as you see, total dynamic footprint is about 20 kilos, and only 5 kilos is occupied by Java, Java code. Other 7 kilos uh, uh, ta are taken by uh, embeds native libraries. Mm. Uh, then total static footprint, Java here takes a little bit more than half. And uh, if you talk about Java heap size, for this particular demo, it's enough to have Java heap with uh, 8 kilo and no more. It's enough. It, as you see, it can uh, operate without pro problems and uh, his response is quick. So that's all about uh, this particular research. Uh, and now I would like to call Derek and he will tell you about uh, a little bit about Sunspot project. Okay. Thanks. So Let's see. Okay, is this working? Yeah, okay. Uh, so we've been working uh, within uh, Sun Labs and, and then Oracle Labs uh, in this space for quite a few years, really trying to get, uh, trying to sell the idea that Java would be a very powerful tool uh, to program small embedded devices and would open up uh, lots of hardware capabilities to ordinary Java programmers, which there are many, many, as opposed to some very specialized embedded C programmers. I'm really uh, excited to see that the company has taken this up uh, as a real product now. Uh, and so what we want to talk about here is, uh, you know, the product is just up, up and coming, but to show some of the other things that people were able to do uh, with some uh, similar capabilities uh, in the research project that we had. 
so I guess one question I have is how many people here uh, have heard of the sunspots or have seen the sunspots? Okay, so it's a third or half. Yeah, I know. Um, so what it was is a research in Oracle Labs that had, uh, there's obviously some research questions that we had. And you know, the first is, can we really take, um, bring the power of Java and the simplicity of Java to allow people to sense and interact with the real world? And some parts of that are, can you write embedded applications in this space? Uh, uh, and the second was, could you write the embedded OS itself, the device drivers, the interrupt handling, this, the, uh, the radio stack, and things like that in Java? Uh, and as a related but somewhat separate topic, could you write the JVM itself in Java? Uh, and so we had the Sunspot project kind of uh, looked at all those questions. Um, and we ended up with, uh, with an artifact, a set of hardware and software and SDK for uh, prototyping uh, things. So it was based on the Java ME CLDC APIs. Uh, and then we designed some transducer APIs uh, that are, are similar in, in scope to the, the device access APIs. Uh, and this is probably one of the only uh, SunLab slash Oracle Labs research projects that was actually also slash a product that you could buy in, in the company store, which is very confusing to management, but uh, we worked through that. Uh, so the basic thing is uh, an ARM processor based on, on the, the bottom board there that also has a built-in radio using an 802.15.4 uh, radio chipset. It's a low, low power, low, uh, uh, low range radio. Uh, then it had um, a pluggable sensor board that uh, we provided a lot of built-in sensors. Um, and in fact, one of the lessons learned. Oh, oh, thank you. There we go. OK. <laughs> I will wave, you can ex extend my hand. Um, one of the things that we found sort of looking back at things is it was, uh, we had so many nice slick uh, peripherals that we put on the demo sensor board that uh, it sometimes overshadowed the expansion capability that we also had with GPI opens, uh, UARTs, the SPI buses, um, et cetera. So uh, here's a couple of spots. This is them in real life. They're a bit smaller in that picture. Uh, and we had some very simple little demos that were that a lot of fun to run. Uh, this is a bouncing ball demo. So use the accelerometer to uh, you know emulate a little physics simulation of bouncing ball. You can have two of them. Um, no, you probably didn't notice when this turned on that they both turned on blue. This one realized there already is a blue one, a uh, blue ball, so it changed to green. And then you can do some things like you can break the ball between them, so now the ball is bouncing between these. And if you had three spots, you'd bounce between three. If you had 27 spots, the balls would bounce between these. Um, so it's a trivia application. It's a couple of pages of code. It's very simple to write. And as a demo, it's very mesmerizing to just stare, staring at these things. So it's a lot of fun. Um, but in some sense, perhaps if we had a ship this as this with the wires hanging out, it would have also highlighted the fact that, in fact, uh, half the power in front of this is actually all the things that you, you don't uh, have to be constrained by what's built in. You can actually expand things quite a bit. Uh, and so these have been sold. Uh, uh, news thousands of these have been, have been shipped uh, to students and developers uh, across the world. They're used in many, many different kinds of projects, from environmental monitoring in jungles uh, or in the Bay Area. Uh, there's a, a project by the uh, uh, U.S. government to, uh, I guess, renaturalize some of the uh, desalinization uh, salt flats that have been around the Bay Area. And they were trying to, they didn't want to release all the salt at once, but they wanted to you know, monitor things. Uh, the, a lot of education projects, a lot of uh, it's very interesting and sometimes bizarre art projects. And it's a useful prototyping tool both uh, for companies, for hobbyists, and uh, within Oracle itself. Uh, so some of the things we've used it within Oracle are to monitor uh, uh, environmental conditions within data centers or power usage within data centers. Uh, and then there was uh, a few years back, uh, Sun put together this black box project, a whole data center and a, a shipping container. And uh, we outfitted those with uh, sunspots. So as the device, as the containers are being shipped around the world, uh, we could track to see if the uh, drivers abuse the things and was like driving over curbs and knocking servers all over the place. Um, so that was kind of fun. The only thing that was actually running while the container was in motion uh, and could track that stuff. Oh, and this uh, grab bag of uh, little projects we had. Uh, the airplane-like thing is actually a model rocket. So we sort of uh, were able to uh, track acceleration forces of rockets in flight, uh, all kinds of robotics things. 
the things with the flag is the very useful Morse code to signal flag translator, in case you, you needed that. Um, you know, uh, it's just things when, when the managers start programming, they come up with some really amazing things. Um, and, and that's one of the fun things about the project is sort of what people did with, with these things, or things that you would never imagine. Uh, some of the things that will be like prototypes you can imagine someone selling, and some of them were things like that that no one would ever make for you, but it was something that somebody wanted and they could do for themselves uh, quite easily. Uh, another project that which is actually ongoing right now is uh, an internal prototype is a container monitoring solution, uh, which we're actually demoing uh, here at Open World and at the Java uh, Embedded Conference tomorrow. Uh, and, and if you go to those conferences, you can see them uh, in the, the uh, demo areas. Uh, so I have one here. You see that's a shipping container, and that one actually has two devices sticking out stick out the door uh, uh, through the door seal. And so this is a prototype uh, device that has uh, satellite radio, uh, satellite modem, uh, GSM modem, uh, GPS, environmental sensors for conditions inside the container, and also a bunch of sensors that together do uh, uh, intrusion detection. And it's built, uh, this is the nice slick one. This is this is the prototype one, which kind of gives you a better sense of what's going on. A processor, a prototype uh, uh, GSM modem and GPS device. And they're communicating, this one is just communicating uh, through the uh, serial port, and then it has a digital uh, out pin, which sends a signal to turn this on and off, and it has a digital input pin, which then verifies that it's been turned on or off. And that's actually enough those, those simple signals are enough to do uh, very elaborate applications. Okay, and then once you add the intrusion uh, devices on there, then you can start, because you have Java code running on the device, you can start doing some sensor fusion to eliminate false alarms. Um, for example, we have some sensors that uh, monitor the door, if, whether the door is open or not. Uh, when the containers are in shipping, the, the uh, containers can flex a bit. So you can imagine going over a big pothole or something and the doors actually can bounce open a little bit. But we combine the signals from the door intrusion with accelerometer readings. So we can realize, aha, we just hit one massive uh, bump. The door has been closed again. It hasn't opened up again. We're not going to bother uh, sending uh, data, to either sending a false alarm, which can be quite expensive, uh, or we're, uh, because we're filtering it on the device, we don't have to uh, do sort of emergency communication back to the back end, which can cost um, in the case of satellite radio, it's going to be quite expensive. Okay, so back to robots. We've also been able to make a, a whole, a, 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 we, the, the community has built a, a many, many uh, robots based on Java, embedded Java with small devices, and APIs like the Device Access API. So my favorite is the, the little red guy, the robot I got from Toys R Us, and uh, put a Sunspot backpack on him and a motor controller, and he drives around with a threatening sword. That's good about how the, the, the middle robot uh, has a, is like a legged robot of some sort. Uh, the top one in white is uh, uh, Roomba. It's an iRobot. Uh, for educational purposes, they sell um, uh, one of the vacuum cleaner robots without the vacuum cleaner, uh, and you can uh, program it to drive around remote control of a sensor. And then we had a whole, whole army of tank-based robots uh, at a Java 1 a few years back at a um, uh, uh, tutorial session that was a lot of fun. So everybody that got to, they went to that tutorial got to program the robots and they were going all over the place. Um, and finally, one of the most uh, exciting uses we found for Java in the embedded space is actually uh, providing the, the Java VM for the first robotics competition. So this is one of the largest uh, uh, high school robotics competitions uh, in North America, if not the world. Uh, and there are thousands and thousands of teams. Um, this culminates into um, a world championship with about 20,000 people or so. Uh, they don't quite fill up a football stadium, but it's a pretty impressive crowd for, for a bunch of geeks. And you have teams of, I can't actually prove to you whether or not that that team itself is running Java and the robot, but about a third of the teams do. And it's just an amazing amount of work that these kids are able to, to work in about six weeks to both build the robot and program the robot. And by the way, the programmers don't have a working robot for that until about week five and a half. Right, so they have to, they're always getting the short end of the stick on these things. 
Uh, so the fact that they're able to use their uh, job experience that maybe they're getting from uh, school for the, maybe the AP computer science classes uh, and, and use some of that experience, uh, but certainly you no know, embedded s software experience. They're able to uh, develop robots that sometimes have things like traction control, automatic target aiming systems. Uh, it can be quite, quite elaborate. Uh, and so there's uh, quite a few lessons we've, we've learned from the Sunspot. Um, and first, that Java is indeed quite capable of, of uh, working on these small embedded uh, spaces. And ordinary Java programmers without much experience uh, by using, reading some data sheets and, and looking at some Java APIs can develop some really interesting products. Uh, we give Java the control of, of these interfaces. Uh, it opens up my, it sometimes, um, you know, the imagination is the limit on these things. It's really kind of wide open on what you can do. Another lesson we learned is if you think back to our original research goals about writing so many things in Java, and then that maybe that isn't exactly the, the, the best thing to do. Like we would not write our radio stack and IPv6 stack and, and mesh networking routing perhaps in Java if we're going to start again. If there's a C library that does that, that's fine. We'll just call out to that. Uh, so, so conclusion for the talk. Um, wait, what happened? Wrong way. There we go. Uh, so small and budget Java is, is now escaped. It's coming out of the labs and it's going to real products. And we're, uh, we're really excited to see that. Because if you think about what Java's been used for for the last, what, 12 years now or more, it's been used for flinging bits across a network or flickering pixels on a screen. And now you can actually use Java code to interact with the real world, to sense, interact, and make things happen. And the device access API uh, is, a, is a fairly simple uh, but powerful way to, to make that happen. Uh, and then with the work uh, that we showed here with these small embed boards, uh, uh, it really lets Java hit certain price points that, that's never been, been able to hit before. And it lets you make just a wide variety of things, including robots. Uh, so, so that's it for, uh, for the prepared parts. Do you have uh, any questions? Uh, yes? Yeah, what's the unit price uh, currently for a Sunspot device? Uh, yeah, so the Sunspot devices are, th are still available on the Oracle store, I think for $300, three or $400 for a, a package of two and a half Sunspots. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So one of the, the half sunspot is actually the, uh, the controller board and the radio <coughs> chip without any sensors and without a battery that's typically used as a router to connect your, your desktop to the, the devices. Yeah. Yes? Besides the embed board, have you guys tried like an Arduino or anything like that for another microprocessor? That's going to be a challenging target because they typically don't have um, as much RAM yeah. on uh, flash. RAM. It, has, it has two less RAM, so... Uh, now we, uh, now uh, as, as you see, we fulfill the task to run Java uh, on tw 12, 20 kilobytes of RAM, and so as you know, Arduino has much less than 12, 20 yeah, kilos. And the flash Maybe in the future, but not now. Now, now it's not a realistic task. Yeah. And it's a sort of a, it's a, at the microprocessor level. It's an older architecture. Uh, the ARM, the ARM Cortex chips are coming along pretty well. Uh, yes. Um, two questions. One that kind of follows up on that. So, is the ARM microcontroller about the smallest that you plan to support, or is there any other microcontrollers that are cheaper and smaller that you're planning on supporting? Okay. Remember our safe harbor statement where we don't promise anything in the future. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but if we were, I, uh, yeah, uh, I, it wouldn't. It's not uh, not targeted specifically at ARM, but they a lot of the ARM products do happen to be in what we see as a sweet spot. Um, also, um, when, I, uh, when I'm working with C or Assembler on a microcontroller, it's relatively easy for me to calculate the kind of response time I'm going to get with an interrupt. Mm -hmm. um, is it hard to calculate what your response is going to be with an interrupt with a Java stack on top of it when you're handling the interrupts on the pins? Yeah. Uh, by, by the way, feel free to, to uh, jump in. To, to, to talk about interrupts. Uh, Eventually, we don't know, we don't provide any support for interrupts at Java level, as you know, uh, but uh, during uh, some specific, but, but while we are porting Java on a particular hardware, for example, on the embedded board, we have to uh, 
uh, work with some interrupts, process them. And this level, we can use some native debuggers, debuggers for example, provided by, by ARM or other tools to, to, to calculate uh, the response or something like this. Right, but so it, the, the device access APIs will, uh, has APIs that are things like uh, wait for wait for pin 7 to go high or wait for it to go low or whatever. Now, there's most likely going to be some inner processing happening under the hood between there. And like you say, the, the characterizing that latency is going to be difficult. Uh, so there could be things that are that are time critical that actually should still be pushed uh, into either into native code provided by the platform or or by yourself. So just just remember that Java is not a real time operation system. That it's very difficult to uh, to rely on uh, some predictable time, some predictable support. It always has some latency and so on and so forth. So and it turns out for robots, uh, latency hasn't been. Uh, uh, an issue. So even for the Java, the first robotics thing, we're using an interpreted only VM uh, with a straightforward GC, uh, nothing nothing fancy, and it and it, it's been working fine. You can get into trouble if you allocate out the wazoo, but it, if you use a little, little caution, it's okay. Now, does anybody here uh, have their own projects they've done in Java, the embedded space? Yes. Right. Okay. Oh no, that was. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, do you want to, anything you'd like to, to talk about or, or share? Or? Um, I do. Uh, I dabble with uh, some robotics and hardware control systems, or like that. And so, I use Java on ARM. Oh, okay. Great. That a little bit, um, but uh, it wasn't using. You guys didn't support ARM. It was uh, another company. I can't remember the name of the company. Oh, okay. I had a software company um, uh, uh, about a decade back in the home automation sector, and uh. we used special. <laughs> Oh, that's, well, that's great. So, so it's nice to hear that you guys are going to be supporting that. Yeah, that's great. And there was someone over here? Um, I used, uh, it was about six years ago, so um, this was a Java stamp. Mm. It's a processor with a, a Java interpreter built into it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really run a JVM. Um, there was a similar bot with uh, a display, uh, an IR sensor, and a little meter. Well, there's the the wait for uh, wait for for, for uh, sort of uh, as an example. For example, uh, if you want to not not interrupts, but uh, we operate uh, in listeners uh, some uh, using listeners paradigm. So, for example, if you uh, want to get a notification, then the GPO GPIO pin uh, has changed its value from zero to one. You can uh, subscribe. Create a special list and ask, subscribe it, and uh, on a Java layer it will look, it will look like you uh, get uh, your your um, some some your function of the listener is called when uh, an event occurs, but uh, under the level and uh, in the native layer uh, we process a, spec uh, a specific interrupt and then uh, construct an event and send it uh, on a Java layer so this way. So, any other questions? Yes, in the back. Just real quick, are the schematics for this robot available online anywhere? For the, the, the tracked robot? Yeah. No, it's uh, unavailable. If, uh, if you, you are aware about microcontroller, 
embed. Yeah, it's available. You can uh, visit em embed.org and purchase it. But the robot is only our research internal product. So and not not yet uh, at, at what at this moment. That's yeah. be a good example, though. Yeah. 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 Okay. If, if there's nothing else, uh, we will wrap up. We can be up here to answer questions until they kick us out. Okay. Thank you very much.